previously on Reading in Church and Other Distractions. Oh, I brought something in. Yes? Oh, I don't have it. I don't see it. But I had brought in... Uh, remember that? There's this commentary that I like to use as a bad example. It's like, just, don't use this commentary. I use it with my students and I say, here's an example. Remember the, when Jesus... They're, they're, Jesus cast the demons into, into the pigs. pigs and yes. this guy spends about a page on uh, defending G- the destruction of so many pigs. <laughs> it <just laughs> seems like a, a strange apologetic point. I've run in something about Isaiah. Was Let's gonna, not judge Jesus okay, I was because gonna, of his hatred of pigs. I was, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Let's here's five points on why we shouldn't judge Jesus. <laughs> these, 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 Maybe he's Jesus. These Maybe animals. we can start there. Well, and then he ended with, "You think you're smarter than Jesus?" <laughs> he almost says it. I was going to throw that out and mess you up with Isaiah, but right, you think you're smarter I than Jesus? I think God delivered you from that because I can't find that. Oh well. Anyway, we'll, we'll, put, we'll blame him. that. Oh, Emmanuel. Yes. Well, yeah. So here's a. All right. So yes. Welcome to reading in church and other distractions with Rob and Mike. This week's episode. Singing Soldiers and Scary Yule Logs. A Christmas to Remember. Well, welcome to the Christmas podcast. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. We have to be careful. Make sure it's Santa and not Jabba. Uh, the meaning changes. But uh, yeah, the, the Christmas text. So this will be uh, coming out just a couple weeks before Christmas. So. Uh, give you a chance to think about these mm-hmm. texts. At least that's the goal. Yeah. And uh, or the first option for Christmas. I guess the, there's we as we discovered there are three options. There are there are alternate readings in the lectionary. So this these are the primary readings that we're looking at today. This is the Isaiah nine and Psalm ninety six and Titus two and Luke two. Naturally, we have to have a a good Christmas passage in there. But uh, this brings the end to Advent for the season for us, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So wow. so we've actually. You know, should this turn out to be terrible, we can pretend we were, <laughs> this podcast was, well, we were just planning on yeah, doing. we can exchange it. We have the receipt. Just, uh, we were just planning on doing Advent. That's, I don't know what people were Should doing. we exchange gifts now, or do you want to wait till? I, uh, <laughs> you might want to give me some time. Um, <laughs> except this pen <laughs> that I have found on your desk. But uh, again, I'm Robert Wallace. And I'm Mike McKeever. And we're at, uh, in, in our offices at the undisclosed university here our uh, fortress of solitude getting ready to across uh, from the printer <laughs> and copier with colleagues running by the door so who knows what we'll so hear. some some churches might do this on christmas eve as i looked at different places that's true so it might be one of the reasons there's multiple readings for christmas so with christmas on sunday this year yeah i mean may, maybe so maybe we need an alternate set but let's make it confusing what we're doing next week so it's the first well we'll figure it out we'll figure that out i think it's the is it the first day of Christmas or the twelfth day of the seventh day of Christmas? How are we going to do this podcast now? There's a first Sunday after Christmas, Boy, but I'm not sure. These are questions <clears throat> we're going to have to get answers. I hope we don't have to bring our liturgical oh friend back. That's <laughs> too soon. Goodness knows, goodness knows how that'll go. It's only been four weeks. That's true. That's true. So, uh, would you like to to start off yeah. with one of the one of my texts? Yeah. Why don't I start Testament? with Isaiah? Isaiah okay. nine, two through seven. Mm. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You okay there? You have increased its joy. I wasn't checking whether it was recording. (laughs) They rejoice before you as with joy at harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor, you have broken on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Wow. Yeah. Seems like a good Christmas time. Yes. <laughs> Nothing puts us in that Christmas spirit like the blood being burned as fuel for the fire. Yeah. Yeah, that is a that is a wonderful Yule log image there. Uh, <laughs> Bring a Christ- the blood pudding. <laughs> a Christmas to remember. <laughs> Throw another blood-soaked garment on the 
on the fire. fire. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, wow, good times. This, uh, you know, this is one of those, every now and then, you know, that reputation of the Old Testament being rough. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's well earned, I guess. And times. maybe include a few bu- boots of the tramping warrior. <laughs> Man. That's, yeah. Isaiah. Well, do you want to ask a question it. or do you want me to just... Uh, yeah, well, you can get ready to ignore questions. I, oh, here, sure. Here, here's to. my impression. Let's see. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Mm-hmm. Hmm. hmm. Is that like people out like looking at <laughs> at Christmas lights? I Probably don't think. Not. No, I don't okay. think so. No, no. I mean, this. Remember, we're we're still very close to the oh, passage. Oh, we we're talked not at about. Christmas in Isaiah yet. <laughs> well, remember last week. <laughs> Uh, last week when we talked about the Isaiah 7 passage and that that challenge that was issued to the king of Israel and how he was uh, challenged with faith and decided to to not put the Lord God to the test because he wasn't going to do what God said anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then Isaiah goes and they have the son Maharshal Hashbaz. And then that's in chapter 8. And then in chapter 9, we have those who've walked in darkness have seen a great light. And this child who's been born is, of course, speculation as to who Isaiah, who the Isaiah of Jerusalem, uh, Isaiah of Jerusalem who's speaking these words, uh, who, what did he think uh, when these words came out of his mouth? Because likely yeah. he wasn't thinking in terms of, I bet 700 years from now, mm-hmm. there'll be a kid yeah. born. I have no idea what this is. Named but Jesus. Man. Yeah. So what was he thinking about? And, and so it's possible that the child that's born here is see the desire was always for a king like David right somebody who actually cared about what God said I mean David had his problems but one thing you had to say about David was he always cared about what God said and when he didn't do what God said it deeply troubled him and so that that expectation of a king like David that that messianic expectation and we use that term messianic just as a Hebrew word masiach meaning anointed so that God's anointed would come, and, and the real one, the good one, the one who uses the kingship the way God would want them to use the kingship for God's Torah, God's instruction. And so this expectation is is all throughout the prophets, right? You see it in Micah 5, you see it a lot of places. And what ends up happening is the prophets, I think, were kind of hoping they would see it. They were, they were hoping mm. when they spoke that maybe, the, maybe this king mm. will okay. be the good king. Right. And and so there is speculation that unto us a child is born, a son is given. Isaiah says this thinking maybe Hezekiah. Okay. That yeah, that no. this this king, who by the way is a good king, um, who also has his problems, but tries to use the kingship for God. Uh, and it, later on in Isaiah, Hezekiah is the hero of this story. That, that right. he's very much yeah. the yeah. the one who is, even though he has his mistakes and he has his trouble, he does repent and Israel is delivered miraculously mm-hmm. as a result of it. So it's one of those things where I think Isaiah, boy, I was really hoping this yeah. this guy, this yeah. this is going to be the you know, this is the quarterback we draft this year who's mm-hmm. going to be the savior for, <laughs> yeah. for our football team. <laughs> Cubs, um, or, Go yeah, Cubbies. Yeah, or this is Go. going to be the, the year that we have these. But and then it's like, well, maybe maybe next year. I right? live with a Cubs fan, so I get it. <laughs> maybe get the it. next year is the one that's the good yeah. one. Maybe the next year. Yeah. And so now what we see here in Isaiah 9, and I think what the lectionary reading is forcing us to realize, this has now happened. We have finally have mm. the the one who embodied what God, what the people were looking for and what God is desperate for, that child who is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, father, okay. prince of peace. Okay. All right, I was so, going to ask you, I was going to say, are they looking for a David uh, like guy because he's like, he really cares about what God says or that he can uh, soak their enemy's well, robes in blood yeah. and maybe take a few boots in the. Well, they, you know, they were facing, as we talked about last week, they were facing. Did they a, separate those two? They didn't. And they were facing a very real problem. Yeah. The Assyrians were coming, their neighbors, the Israelites are coming, the the um, Arameans are coming. Oh, it's and, the holidays get crazy. Oh, no, they do. You're always. Guess, always. Ex- Unexpected guests Unexpected. dropping yes. in all the time, and so they didn't. I mean, you know, they they really had a very real problem with yeah. this this enemy around them. And you know, that's one of the things we always leave those parts out of our Christmas cards, yes. right? So if we're going to quote this verse in a Christmas card, you start in verse six, right? Okay. It's unto us a child is born. Yeah. You don't do the blood soaked <laughs> part on your Christmas card. No, but it's it's yeah. a different card. It really is. <laughs> the tone is different, and uh, it's the same thing when you quote Micah five. 
you always and go, who doesn't and who, well it's the yeah, everybody does this time of year right. right out of you Bethlehem yeah. one for you right but we always have to stop before well, Micah goes on to say it's going to be in Luke because he's really going to kick the butts of the Assyrians yeah you know you don't yeah. you don't put that part on the Christmas card because right. but that's what Micah was hoping for yeah. we'll finally sure. have one yeah. who will come out of Bethlehem like David who's going to be the king that we desperately well, all want. of these texts uh, are very interesting in the light of what we're going to read in Luke I mean it's just like oh the expectation and then. The, the, the fulfillment is, is fascinating. Yeah. But I, we won't get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, I know you want to jump to Luke. No, not yet. I know. <laughs> always. Yeah, that's it, why. If I can't think of uh, who, I'm, who, the, who the person is I'm quoting, it always <laughs> says Luke. You know, yeah. like when you say, well, you can't. If I, couldn't, if I couldn't think of a Hebrew word, I always say Spanish for some reason. <laughs> yeah. what, do you, what do you do It goes Spanish? somewhere else with a, a foreign language I kind of know, you know. Oh, I see. That's so, the way your brain works. Yeah, I do that with Luke. Oh, okay. I think it's in Luke. That, Enough about me, though. <laughs> so that's that's really, I think, what's at work in this passage is seeing seeing this expectation, this deep desire for mm-hmm. for one who can solve our problems the way and and do it the way God would want it done, and 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 particularly remember this is on the heels of the disappointment of Ahaz, right? Where yeah. Ahaz is given a chance to really see God manifest and show faith and Ahaz said yeah I'm not planning on asking because I'm not planning on <laughs> doing what God says anyway so no big I'll just <laughs> he's like the manager in office space so. <laughs> yeah that's if you could bring us a deliverer that'd be great <laughs> it's not really a big deal I'm not me. I'm not going to put a lot of effort into it exactly that's exactly good. yeah yeah no that's good to, re- to remind me of the context that uh, yeah that child mm-hmm. awesome. awesome so yeah so I think he's he's hoping for something now, but mm-hmm. it doesn't happen. Right. We talk about we talk about um, the jubilee. We both talk about jubilee yeah. in our courses, and I te- I talk about it the transition from uh, uh, the original jubilee to which there's no record of them keeping. Right. They and never then, actually. And followed. then and then the new jubilee Isaiah's talking about uh, return from Babylon, mm. and they and they and they built, rebuild. You know, they're back in their land. They rebuild the temple. Yay, we got the temple again. And then everybody cries because it's not... It's not nice. It's, it's not, not as good as it was. Yeah, it's not as good as it was. And on Christmas, if someone opens a gift and they thank you and they go, yay, and then they cry, it's probably... Yeah. It's, a, uh, it's an indication. A gift receipt. You know? <laughs> it's an indication. It's not quite there. Not so they keep thinking like, well, the ultimate jubilee. You know, it's like this is a is a, is a portion. This is a semi-fulfillment. They, they continue to talk about jubilee, yeah. even after that disappointing one or less yeah. than... Uh, eschatological, the final jubilee. So, yeah, you see this kind of thing throughout Scripture. All right, Psalm 96? Sure. This is a great psalm. It, it Well, it is. It's one of mine. Yeah. yeah. I, did my, I did my dissertation. Did oh, wow. Well, okay. Um, well, well, let's watch the time here. <laughs> this is one of mine. <laughs> well, I wrote 100 pages on the, the Luke and infancy, so... <laughs> Oh man! This may be a two part. I was gonna say, this, <laughs> welcome to our first four-hour podcast, ladies My and gentlemen. <laughs> Take us through all three services on uh. Christmas. Okay. All right, Psalm ninety-six, uh, one through thirteen. Mm-hmm. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with truth. That's just a lot. That's, <laughs> that's, this is it's, awesome. It's nice, isn't it? That's, that's like a, a football song. spike and a <laughs> end zone dance, and it's a that's an amazing song. It is. It's in that. It's in the section of the the Yahweh. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Yahweh Malach. The the Yahweh reigns. 
the Lord is King Psalms that you have there and the kingship of Yahweh Psalms. So we're in 93, um, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. All of those are the section of Psalms that emphasizing how God is king, which really is, is the way Israel as a nation understood God from a very early. I mean, when they cross over on dry land in Exodus and the song of Miriam and the song of Moses are sung, the Lord reigns. He is a king okay, in yeah, that passage. Right. So from the very beginning yeah. of Israel's existence, Yahweh reigns. And, right. And it the, seems like, is this, is this like something that you explicitly tell? They recite this in the temple. The temple seems so, and, 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 uh, co- it almost evokes a context of, of you know, reciting this in a temple setting. It, it feels like it would be a communal thing, doesn't it? I mean, uh-huh. it feels like it needs to be having a liturgical feature to it. Of course, you know, how these things functioned originally, you know, is, is a, the context is in many ways lost to history. I just really don't know hmm. how it would have originally been used. Uh, there are, I don't know. There are plenty of people who will tell you they know. I'm, yeah. I'm one of those people yeah. who doesn't. I'm willing to have a little humility. Well, I have <laughs> no idea. We are professional I, <laughs> mansplainers. So <laughs> That's a fair point. I'd um, lob that across your plate. And see. The, the uh, you know, how it's used, I don't know. I will say it's some unusual. I mean, one of the things it does here is the, the Lord being the Lord of all the nations. That is a, a later image that you get. Hmm. A lot of times it's in Israel and Israel is in charge, and God is king in Israel. Here, yeah. um, there, there's a much more, you know, declare the glory among the nations, his, and all these families of these peoples ascribing strength and honor, and say among the nations, Yahweh is king. And it's mm-hmm. not, we have Yahweh, and our Yahweh is better than your gods. It's, you don't actually have gods, right. and you need to recognize Yahweh is king. So, so we get a clear monotheism here, where there are no other gods in the world, just Yahweh is the one who's who's the real God out there. Um I mean, so much great stuff here, right? I mean, the fields exalting the trees. Mm. I love the sea is actually is, yeah. is roaring in roaring. favor of God Let now. The I sea mean, roar. yeah, the, the sea, sea is roar. the That's, sea is scary. The the bad guy. Yeah, the sea is the bad guy. The yeah. sea is that that personification of chaos, or I should, I guess, the huh. the dragon is the personification of the sea, and the sea is always yeah. scary yeah. and chaotic. It'll kill you. Uncreation. You know? It is. Yeah. It's uncreation, but not here. No, no, the sea huh. is. Roaring and everything that's in it is is roaring and praising and for God here because God is on those. So it's still expectation, and it is celebration and expectation. But it's this expectation of, of really, you know, no this, lions roaring. Awesome. See, no, there they no, dealt with those pesky, they, that, those pesky lions. lion. Problem. Yeah, that that and the swamp, the swamp, swamp jackals, jackals that we've dealt with for weeks. <laughs> it's all in the past. <laughs> it's all in the past. And if you're just joining our podcast, we've now required you to go back in time <laughs> to figure out what we're talking about. Where are the swamp jackals in the Bible? Um, yeah, this is this is just such a celebratory psalm and such a great psalm, and, hmm. and uh, I, I mean, worship is here. I mean, all these great words, right? You know, worship and honor and majesty and glory and roaring, <laughs> roaring, exulting. You know, I was as you were reading it this time, I was thinking how um, uh, Revelation, in many ways, yeah. the language of mm-hmm. Revelation being invoked. I mean, I've heard people call the Revelation the Psalms of the New Testament because there's so yeah. much singing in there. Well, we always read Revelation five. And then I and then I, and then when we're done, I could probably do it with this too. I used to have people with their arm out, and I go, "Feel your arm now. You should have goosebumps, okay? Because it doesn't get any better than this. If you don't, if you, you don't, then feel your feel your neck. See if check you have your a pulse, pulse because it's not right. Because it's not going to get any better. Although this is this is uh, this is awesome stuff. It really right? is. It's it's glory. I mean, yeah, it's just just wonderful. I mean, what do you say? I mean, I don't know what else I can Amen. talk about and, a, a uh, lot here, but this is. Very celebratory. All creation is praising, including all of the nations are praising. It's kind of reminded me of that mm-hmm. Isaiah two passage that we looked at a few weeks ago, or Micah four, which is the same same text of that the mountain of the Lord's temple and all the nations streaming unto it, and Torah going out, and everyone coming to learn. I mean, this this mm-hmm. God being the God of everyone and being King of everything, and not not our King fighting your King, but but being the King over all the world, and yeah. judging yeah. all peoples right. with equity and well, it's incredibly positive, you know. Yeah. There's these positive images of all, all of humanity recognizing mm. the lordship of Yahweh, yeah. and that's that's how it culminates, you know, at the that's end of right. Revelation five. All tribes and tongues and peoples and nations acknowledging and describing yeah. uh, glory to God and to the the Lamb. So yeah, mm. this is this is uh, 
in the Hebrew, literally, I've heard it, it's, it's titled "Celebrate Good Times, Come On." Is come that, on, I think that's right. I close. think that's right. It's I mean, close. That, it's that, hard to capture. It's more the of a nuance. dynamic equivalent translation, but yes, I think that's exactly exactly right. what it is. I do. I love that he will judge peoples with equity. You don't get the Israel Israel is best kind of song yeah. here. It is very much, I mean, you don't even get a privilege, that's what I'm trying to say, you don't get a privileged place for Israel in this psalm. It is all the nations, it is judging between all the peoples with equity, so it's not even, hmm. it, 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 you don't even have the mountain of the Lord that we have here, like you have in Micah and yeah. Isaiah. This is even more equitable among the nations. So you have a mature understanding of right. God, and maybe a self, <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a different self-understanding yeah, of maybe. Israel and, and place and things. It's, it's yeah. So. Some people probably argue, you know, those who think about a chronological trajectory would, would do they date this later because of that? I, mean, I would. Yeah. Yeah, I would. And, and part of the reason, you know, I'm, I'm a canonical guy. And, and so for me, the canon and the order of the books in the canon and the order of the Psalms in the canon is important. And one of the things that I have seen at work and other scholars have done this as well is in the beginning of the Psalter, in the first two books, so basically Psalms 1 to 72, you have a lot of talk about David as king and instead of Yahweh as king. You get a lot of Davidic psalms. Oh, yeah, yeah. You get, you know, my king in Jerusalem, a lot of that. Then you get book three, which is Psalm 73 to 89, and it's exile. We've lost mm -hmm. the temple. Yeah. We've, we've lost yeah. the king. We've, you know, God, you said your, your guy would always be on the throne, and now your guy's not on the throne, and I don't know how to handle this, and what are we going to do? And Psalm 89, with this amazing, God, I thought your word was forever, and now it looks like you've broken it. Now how are we supposed to make sense of this? Yeah. And then you come to book four, 90 to 106, and this, you know, in many ways culminating that, I, I would argue that book four is, is changing the focus of the singer away from David as king and away from Davidic covenant and back to Yahweh as king. And in other places, I would argue Mosaic covenant, Torah. And, and the, the responsibility we have not to just trust that God's always going to keep somebody from David on the throne, but in fact to live out God's Torah right. in the world yeah. and, and reach the world you know, with this message of God is king. Sing, bless, declare his glory among the nations. Go and do what <clears throat> your job was to do, which was to show the world who Yahweh is <clears throat> and how to have <clears throat> a life of meaning through Torah. And, yeah. You know, so, yeah, I get, obviously I get wound up on No, it's interesting so, to it's think just, about how they thought about God as king before they had a king and then... And then what what impact did that have when they had good and bad kings? And mm -hmm. then when they don't have kings, right. you know, how are they thinking about uh, Yahweh at that point? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so a great song. Yeah, it is. It's, it's great. And a and, uh, good one to keep for uh, Christmas. Yeah. Awesome. Here's the saving grace here. I know hardly anything about Titus. So. Really? You don't ever do Titus? <laughs> isn't it, isn't when, it in the Bible? Yeah, yeah we, know, we do the pastoral it, epistles. Is this, like, is this an apocryphal reading? Is that what this is? Uh, I'll get to this yeah, book. who would know? <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> looked, know? I looked at it today and my... And my, uh, my uh, but the pages were stuck together, so yeah. I never. Well, this is never one of those, them. I think, benefits of the lectionary, right? Because how often would you? You know, it's Christmas. Let's get out, Titus. You know, <laughs> no one. I don't think we have that sentence. I have a friend. I have a friend uh, uh, who's uh, dean of the seminary, and uh, he especially his chronicles. And wow. He, and I was, I was saying something online about uh, making a theological point, and he. He nuanced it or countered it with Chronicles, and I said, oh, well played, well played. Someone would have to actually go and read Chronicles <laughs> That's to, right. uh, to argue with you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well That's, played, sir. It's a way to win that argument. <laughs> Let's quote something no one has ever read. So, yeah, I hear you. But, uh, I, yeah, Chronicles is a – that's a – that's not a popular text for Old Testament <laughs> folks. That's true. But let's look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in this present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope of the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave him, he it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Okay. Well, there's a there's a couple words in here that make uh, you almost can read this at epiphany because this the word uh, epiphanies shows up a, a couple times and it's going to show up really? in the next I, chapter I didn't too. See it. 
Epiphany. Yeah. Uh, I must yeah. uh, pronounce something. Yeah, which means appeared. <laughs> oh, there the it appearance. is. Appearance. Okay. Appearance. So for like Antiochus Epiphanes. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, God manifest. Yeah. The yeah. the uh, antagonist of the, uh, the intertestamental period is this. Um, you know, that was his nickname. Right. It was like, uh, that he gave himself. Hey, hey, I'm, I'm Antiochus, but call me uh, call God's me manifestation God of God. Manifestation, yeah. My yeah. friends call me manifestation well, of God, or else. In, fair, in <laughs> fairness, he, he was wrestling against the fact that his grandfather was Antiochus the Great. Oh, okay. So when your grandfather's yeah. Antiochus the Great, you, yeah. you need a nickname that's going to, you can't be the even greater. That's like a or, kid you're arguing with calling, uh, calling infinity. And, right, exactly. So he did. He called infinity. There's Antiochus no, Epiphanes. There's no God comeback. manifest. Yeah. So. Yeah. so that word is the God has appeared. Actually, a lot of this language is not, wouldn't just be used by Antiochus, but it would be uh, reserved for Caesar also. Really? So yeah. what, okay, so, so you're saying the language here mm-hmm, is. It could be evoking you know, the politics of the day or the, wow. the uh, who's on the throne. Um, so savior, uh, so when, okay. great God savior. So when they say for the grace of God has appeared, you're saying that they would hear that. They could hear that politically. They could. I'm not sure that that's the first thing they would think about because the, the Caesars have co-opted this yeah. language, you know, um, I'm trying to think of what a parallel would be, right? Is it for the grace of God's been elected? I mean, for the uh, grace. I mean, some I some sort of term that could be associated something, with something secular. Something, you know, we're in a we're in a political season. Um, uh, you know, God's appeared. He's going to make uh, the world great again. Or oh, okay. I'm All with right. Him. Okay. Uh, you know. Okay. To, to just quote so a just, few lawn signs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Random samples there. Right. Gr- growing dust not, now. And... Not sure at this point who won the election. <laughs> so, okay, we're but, trying to stay in the Christmas spirit here, Mike. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we re envisioned the bloody robes on the <laughs> on the fire. Right, okay. right. Post election. Okay. No, no, I can, I can no, do this. I can, can do, do this. this. It's Christmas. So God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of bookend this is uh, between that. So there's been this appearance of, of Christ, uh, God manifest through Christ, which we're going to read about shortly, very shortly. Uh, and but then also there's this tension waiting for the the arrival the parousia parousia uh, the manifestation of the glory of our God, great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So this is pretty high Christology. This is pretty yeah. high understanding of um, of who Jesus is as uh, fully divine. Um, let's see. And the spirit language show up in here too. Maybe we keep reading. It was a larger. I was reading larger sections. Mm. Kind of an implicit Trinitarianism, but. But certainly uh, not holding back to this language of uh, the, the manifestation of the glory of, our great, of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's the same thing. Yeah. The, the manifestation of our, our glory of our great God and Savior Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. That's mm-hmm. the same. Yeah, it is difficult in the Greek, but that's the most obvious way. Because this language, manifestation and Savior, would be used to refer to Caesar, hmm. uh, that's one way you can kind of immediately usage you know, untangle some of the tricky, tricky uh, grammar. So contemporary usage, there's no tr- problem. People are applying that to yeah. someone. Okay, yeah. they know it's not reserved. So it, it's almost as though they'd have to go out of their way to to clarify it if it didn't mean that Jesus is as the manifestation of God. Mm. So it's an understanding that how Christ reveals God's glory to us. Um, he it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purify for himself a people for his own. For his own, who are zealous for good deeds, it's it's very reminiscent of uh, um, Ephesians two, the uh, mm-hmm. the gracious activity um, that uh, God has done the work so that we can do our works. It's uh, mm. and so that's why they couch this moral exhortation in the middle. Uh, this is very very traditional sort of moral exhortation. They just come out of a section on the household where they they go through these. Um, masters and and slaves and children and wives and they these kind of typical categories of moral exhortation in the in the framework of roles in the household even yeah. though the new testament kind of tweaks those and subverts them and focuses more on the pe- on people on the underside and the people without power there as really the good examples for christians uh not not that they were to inhabit those roles but that in christ we have someone who's uh transcended those and transformed those roles so okay um, yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is, it reminds me, you know, this, this is good, good exhortation to mm-hmm. how do we live in light of the expectation of the, uh, arrival of this great mm-hmm. one who mm-hmm. we've, uh, who's already come and manifest God's glory 
as we're waiting the, the return of this one. Um, and so it's not unlike what we read in the Gospels about being ready, living, not not setting the time, but setting the mode of life. How not The question isn't when is he coming, but how will you be living during that time? So mm. putting those, connecting those makes sense in that sort of framework. Um, wow, now that was a great phrase. So that the focus on parousia, the po- focus on the coming of Christ is not on when, but how you should be living when it happens. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, always. Always. I mean, it's always the question is when, and Jesus always changes the question. Okay. Always changes that. And so our end time discourses are typically not answering that question. Right. Even though someone asked that question, the question we need to ask is, did Jesus answer that? No, he answered a different question, which okay. is how should, a, a better question is, how will you be living when I do? So, so it's very. So this is very much in keeping with that, right? Where we're renouncing oh, yeah. impiety, mm-hmm. renouncing worldly passions, yeah. living lives that are self-controlled and upright and godly, to wait for the manifestation <clears throat> right. of glory. So it, right. it is exactly what you're saying. It's that, not when is his manifestation of glory going to come? Right. It's yeah. that expectation pur- it purifies you. It it uh, it encourages you and it energizes that transformation. So his original coming is a infusing of grace that begins this act of transformation but also the waiting and expectation and uh um looking forward is transformative too and and as he would say as you this purification that's going on during this time uh of of a people zealous for good deeds so so now you now that you're living a life right you can do the things that god wants you to do right yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and 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 that expectation plays a role in that yeah yeah get on to Luke 2 so we sure, have some time sure to, yes yeah, someone coming. get Linus to come out here <laughs> and read from Luke 2 yeah, and couldn't get, save the maybe, Christmas pageant maybe when we start using these breaks for commercials <laughs> uh, we can start afford Linus Dolly Madison at, at this point I don't know that we can okay. right. afford Linus so let's go to Luke chapter 2 and, and you can all recite it with me if, you, if you'd like as I'm reading but in those days a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, standard angel introduction, Mm. Uh, because obviously we're Mm -hmm. about to die. So, (laughs) so, And the business card says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah, the Lord, Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. It's a big manger. Uh, When they saw this... (laughs) They made known what had been. Family bed. It's a family bed. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. All right. Should I get comfortable? Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. I think I told you the story about me writing my first chapter of my dissertation. (laughs) It's on this. It's in this area, writing on, Mm -hmm. on, on this, uh, these birth narratives, and 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 like I don't know who I I didn't get reined in, so I wrote a hundred pages. Oh gosh, I wrote a hundred pages. (laughs) A hundred. And now most dissertations are around two. Yeah. And and this is your first chapter. And this is the first of five chapters. Yeah. Yeah. So unless you're at the Sorbonne, that is not enough for too much. So they I had this reader uh, at Princeton, um, uh, (laughs) Robert Wuthno, who was doing a lot of in cultural theory and so they sent a chapter off to him and he sent he said okay here's the questions for the oral for the oral, <laughs> for the oral he thought reader. you were done <laughs> thought I was done he thought that was the whole so dissertation that's the challenge for me <laughs> yeah I get kind of excited about these birth narratives oh wow <laughs> so. well maybe I should ask some questions yeah maybe 
Uh, first of all, were they all in the manger? Like, when are you going to stop? Yeah, them? exactly. Um, <laughs> no, they weren't all. Okay, they weren't all in the manger. That's good. That's good to know. It's um, a comma. I wish you would read the commas. I mean, that's uh, why I put print them out. Well, that's why the commas are there. Yes. Um, well, how about let's, let's go with the one thing that the translation issue that people talk about: the glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom He favors. Because mm. um, I thought we were supposed to show goodwill to, toward toward everyone. Or goodwill toward everyone, and, and I know that's a trend, that's a that's a textual issue, right? That whether or not it's goodwill toward men or men of goodwill, basically, <laughs> is the 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 issue there, and what the difference is. This is this is I think this is not a bad translation. Okay. I think it is more uh, God's disposition towards humanity. Okay, and, and and the other could be implied, but. The I think in the in this context is talking about the the gracious visitation of God, uh, okay, and and His goodwill toward all. So it so is goodwill. Toward it's much all. more. It's God. God is is in view here as the uh, as the subject. Okay. Okay, and and humanity as the object. And and in truth, so men and women. He is in he exclusive. Is, he is favoring. He's already showing favor to those whom no one else would show favor to. So it's not yeah. a, that is not an excluding kind of translation, or shouldn't be a kind of exclusive. It's a lot like there's there there's three angelic appearances in, in, the, in these infancy narratives in, the infancy in Luke narratives. one to two. So okay. first is to Zechariah, mm-hmm. and he yeah, we talked a few weeks ago. How yeah. He really dropped he the dropped ball. the ball on that. Then one, yeah. to Mary, and she's exemplary, and her her, her only question is like, how's this going to happen? Not right. whether it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and then this third one. So that it's this it's a similar sort of greeting. And uh, in all of them, in the sense of God's um, gr- gracious visitation, God's answer to prayer, your mm-hmm. hopes and expectations. But the one to Mary is um, about the goodwill toward Mary. Um, oh, I, what's, the, what's the angelic greeting? I can think of it off the top of my head. They're highly favored. Greetings, yeah, highly God favored. Yeah, yeah, highly favored. So that's the same kind of language uh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's expanding out to these shepherds, okay? So just like Mary's Magnificat talked about her own story and how that's really she's she's emblematic of her, God's God's favor toward all the people. Mm. So here, a, a birth of a child spills over to these shepherds uh, out in the, out in the field. Blue collar guys. Yeah, yeah. and it's very and it's really interesting to read this against the background of this um, this uh, kingship language that we find mm. well in Isaiah and in and Psalm, Psalm and then and then the appropriation of that in Titus. Uh, Caesar language. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very much about uh, kingship, and and Augustus is mentioned, and it's yeah. in the context of a worldwide census. But then it goes to this little town of Bethlehem, mm-hmm. and uh, and then the recipients. Start singing, are they, are I was man, I was sorely tempted <laughs> to <laughs> I wasn't do that. Sure, if you're gonna yeah. start singing. As time allows, we'll splice okay. it back in. Well, I think either yeah. that's coming out of the Luke passage if we're okay. singing. Right? Yeah, okay, so all right. Either... On balance, I'd rather talk all about right. Luke. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, the context is set with Mary, and of course, uh, Mary and Joseph. And, and so in the context of this, this worldwide emperor, he doesn't get this announcement. No. It's these shepherds. And these shepherds are, are like Mary in the sense that she doesn't have a pedigree, and they're just nobodies. And the governor doesn't get this announcement. No, and the governor, nor any of those people. Yeah. yeah, and 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 this is like this isn't just chronology. I had to oh I had to write you know I wrote this book uh, with Joel Green on Luke Acts and New Testament historiography, and I got assigned to re- do the research on Quirinius because oh, okay. oh people are dying to know about that the yeah. whole debate. Maybe you don't know about it. I won't I won't uh, tire you with it. But it's like well wasn't he governor somewhere else at that time? And it's, oh later. And... But the thing is, it's not strictly about chronology when you talk about Augustus or Quirinius. You're talking about um, this would be like saying in the in the days of Nixon. Okay. 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 I, and that was an illustration I used when I taught this in Berkeley. Okay. So it's like uh, that's a nice choice of Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like oh that that's that time that season. Oh that was not good. That was okay. you know. So it's it's not just like 1968 to 72. It means uh, uh, oh oh that was not a you know, good time. Okay. <laughs> These were not good times. Okay. Okay. So it, so it is both evoking this incredible high status, but also the, well, the time. And it comes back to, again, reminding us of the ways in which these biblical authors use these things that would not be the way we would use these things. So mm-hmm. that if we were trying, they're, they're wanting to use this as part of the broader story where we would want to, the way we do history, 
offer you the dates with precision and right. I mean, I, I I use the illustration I always use is in the Old Testament when you say somebody is 120, like Moses lives to be 120. Well, the Bible is saying he was three generations old. Yeah, he was right. you know 40 years as a generation. Yeah. Moses was a grandpa. That was basically yeah. what it's saying. Right. That's going to okay. be the standard okay. age. Moses yeah. was a grandfather. Yeah. And we would want to say 120. He made 120 trips around the sun. No, yeah. he was three generations. Right. That's the way we're using yeah. those. They, they would use the numbers differently. So they're using this. Well, it's not. Key points in history. It's a not bit. a glaring any no, no, problem no, with the chronology. But but those are questions they're maybe not asking. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, you you can explain this very easily. But. The, the issue is we we capture someone if someone talks about it in the days of Nixon now we don't think about that so the, but no 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 seventy three that was right I mean that, yeah. something happened in seventy three right and we'd say well yeah. you know that was that yeah. was in the days of Nixon yeah I right. mean yeah and you would go yeah yeah it's not like it's not it's not so much time as oh that was that era you know okay. a season uh, a time where yeah. uh, had his own character. You know the crazy the crazy sixties. You know yeah. those things, gotcha. and and this is interesting. This he they're going to the city of David, mm -hmm. and they're calling Bethlehem the city of David, right? Which is not which is not the city of David, not the city of David. Yeah, well, city of David is Jerusalem. Unless certainly David the king is Jerusalem. Yeah, but this may be hearkening back to a different his more uh, earlier humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. That would be in keeping with this, this theme of humble origins and mm -hmm. uh, his pastoral uh, origins. So there's a lot uh, in, in terms of. Um, um, how the census functions to set the stage for what God is really doing, because he was descended from the house and family of David, mm -hmm. and neither, neither of them are living in their hometown. So there's a suggestion of mm. well, they're displaced, maybe yeah. economically displaced, not unusual under under Rome. Sure. Lots of people displaced from their land, and this is very close to um, Jerusalem. And of course, um, the the priests and Levites who didn't get any land suddenly right. they get all this land because of Rome. Right. And other people are displaced, so uh, that there's there's economic displacement. So these people are having to journey back to their hometown, mm -hmm. and uh, and and it's in that context. Uh, it also says this is a big story. The, if this is the beginning of the drama, and, and the the stage behind you is very large, okay, the whole world. It says mm -hmm. this is a story that has going to impact the whole world wow. okay. just by invoking those terms it's, it happens in the context of a worldwide census yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's that kind of thing of course um in you know this is this is going to be bigger than uh jerusalem judea the jewish people mm -hmm. okay when mark begins his gospel that's all he talks about jesus is an adult and he's baptized but when matthew and and uh and luke write a couple decades later they're invoking these larger stories so in uh, in in Matthew, you have people from beyond Judaism show mm -hmm. up at the birth, right? Mm -hmm. Who would that Zoroastrians, be? Zoroastrians, the, the Magi. Yeah, the Magi. And, and it's confusing here because in a, um, in a Christmas pageant, both might be wearing a bathrobe and a towel on their <laughs> That's <laughs> okay, true. Right? That's the wise true. guys and the shepherds. So yes. you got to be, yeah, I'll use different colors or something. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're getting deep. We, we are getting sheep deep. versus you know, gifts. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we want to give those practical bits of advice as well. When you're doing your pageants, you, know, yes. you want to make sure. We're here for you. That's right. This is this is a full-service podcast that we're trying to be here. So practical, what those guys <laughs> talk right. about. Things that affect my daily life. So, so different robes for the shepherds and the wise men. Because we have to conflate these at our pageants, right? And, and Luke is very concerned about space communicating theology. So if you remember back in, at least in our discussion as I as I always work with Luke in uh, this story began in the holy place of the temple mm -hmm. when Luke's narrative proper starts it mm -hmm. starts there which is as close as uh, if you're lucky once in your life you'll get picked by lot to go in and burn the incense because there's mm -hmm. so many priests mm -hmm. right and he's mm -hmm. not a high priest so he gets that privilege Speaking to go of Zechariah now yeah Zechariah yeah. right Zechariah um, so it's in the early pages of my first chapter of my just <laughs> For those of you who are following along, <laughs> in my dissertation. you have your copies of the McKeever <laughs> yeah. Luke oh, dissertation. Your microfish. Out. So um, when you when you hear the jazz riff, turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> when you hear the bass line, <laughs> exactly. We turn the page. Exactly. So um, it starts in that in that as as close as you can get to God, unless you're a high priest. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
and John's storyline begins there. But John, we've left off John just before this. He's in the wilderness. He's growing up in the wilderness. John the Baptist is, yeah. Yeah, the, mm-hmm. the opposite space uh, in terms not of yeah. not holiness, uh, temples, everything ordered in its place, and, and that's connected to holiness somehow. And thought of his garden very mm-hmm, often. Mm-hmm, in the mm-hmm, privileged, access, privileged access, spaces of privilege. As dry, As opposed to, yeah, it's, it's, here's, a, here's an open space, uncivilized, mm-hmm. um, has a archetypes of uncreation like the sea. Mm, it does. And so you wouldn't think of a... Uh, and death. I mean, it's often associated with death, the wilderness. Oh, a death. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, Very barrenness much. and unfruitful. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't associate the, the son of a priest of an impeccable lineage of ending up there. Why is he uh, ending up there? And that's where he begins his ministry. Jesus starts on the periphery, and as we continue in his story, he's going to end up at the temple. So there's something going on spatially here. Mm. And glory, the, 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 the most immense manifestation of God's glory is out in a field with shepherds, with sheep. Okay, yeah. As much as shepherds are romanticized in, uh, to, to a certain degree in the Psalms and, and connection to David's pastoral mm-hmm. origins, these, in day, daily life, no. these people are the a bottom rung. You know? They are the lowest of the low. So rabbinic writings would say, uh, you know, the temple has everything in its place and it's it's protected by its walls and the holy of holies and holy places. And, mm-hmm. and Jerusalem's the holiest of cities because of its wall. And a walled city is holier than a right. than an unwalled city. Well these guys live out in the field with animals. Yeah. Okay. So in a purity culture, these guys are at the bottom in a status culture. They're handling dead animals. Yeah. They're handling unclean. I mean they're by definition by their vocation. They are, they are unclean. By vocation, they're uh, later rabbinic writings would call them uh, prototypical sinners and that would have spill over into they're unclean they're impure right. and that just tells you you know so i guess we know about their character you know right so anyway this is where this immense manifestation of god's glory shows up out there in the fields uh, to the shepherds you know mm-hmm. um and it's not as just like mary there's no there's nothing to prepare us for this when when the angel shows up greetings favored one you know yeah. other than that's god's that's that's God. That's God's character. That's God shows up when you don't expect. Well, and his disposition toward the the least, the ones who nobody cares about, yeah, yeah, yeah. or would dismiss. And you could say it's not just it's not. It, there's this reversal going on spatially, status wise, maybe some purity issues, but it's not it's not ultimately a reversal that excludes anyone. It just it just shatters all of our predetermined notions about mm-hmm. how we mm-hmm. how we. Um, Kind of pigeonhole people, and I think by implication, how God we were thinking that's how God thinks about people, or mm. or holiness, or uh, there's no hope. We write write people off, and there's these people at the bottom who get this manifestation, the the glory of heaven and the hosts of heaven, um, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, "Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those Does, whom He favors." In the Old Testament. Host always has a military picture yeah. to it. Mm-hmm. Does host have a military image in the New Testament? That's what that word means. We we read it since it's lacking in that in the context it shows up. Right. It's not that kind of savior who's being born. It's a more. Uh, it's not a Davidic uh, had, so, had centralized so his power in Jeru- Jerusalem. What we're hearing is, uh, and suddenly there was with this angel making the announcement, a huge army that immediately burst out into song. Yeah. Then suddenly the shepherd said, "Holy cow! This is a musical. I had no idea." Right? <laughs> it's this the is, Salvation Army. Will you join in our crusade? Is <laughs> yeah. that what it says? Yeah. <laughs> is it Les Mis? Is that what happened just now? <laughs> well, I think you would probably have to say, "Oh, continue not fearing," because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would. By the way, one angel. <laughs> And here's a bunch and of. And then shows the military yeah, ang- arm of the angels. Armed angels who showed up. Yeah. And so. Wow. You know, I mean, that you know, until this, I honestly had never thought about that until this moment. Oh. And it's and it's in a very, it's like, this is a dangerous incursion of holiness out into this impure area. You know, it's yeah. really scary holiness. Breaking this, these these ideas of where holiness is going to show up. That then start singing. It's relativizing Jerusalem and the temple. <laughs> so I'm changing our ideas about armies singing <laughs> completely. Okay. Saying, and then one angel began a tap dance routine. I've seen Salvation Army bands occasionally at Christmas <laughs> Not time. Not like this though. But right? this, this is, is yeah. big. Yeah. This is huge. But I don't think they carry weapons huge. in the Salvation Army. That's what this is. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. And they're going to make things great again. <laughs> um, yeah. So it is this angel. You know, the child that is born, Isaiah, uh, uh, born unto us. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this this child is not just 
Mary and for Mary and Joseph or, or Bethlehem or the Jewish people, but for all, all people. Mm. So all is kind of symbolized by uh, taking the least, you right. know, Jesus will choose a child. You got, you know, this is who this grace is for. Nobody like a child. Right. Uh, or all these examples, these counter examples. So it's, it's a, an ex, ex, surprising. I mean, we're so familiar. As we said, this, these are overly, overly familiar, familiar texts. Text. There's nothing more familiar than this text. Okay. Yeah. As we, as we hear it read, and it saves the Christmas pageant every right. year for uh, the, the Peanuts game. Yeah. Um, so it is it is hard to ca- recapture the, the startling nature of this. I, I've always thought it was odd that, that the angel gives them a sign. Because, you know, signs are those things mm-hmm. that confirm the word that is spoken is true. Right. And, and so when the angel tells you to do something, oh, and you'll know I'm telling you the truth. It's like, well... I, what, I, what, it was not predisposed not to listen to you, Mr. Angel. When, <laughs> yeah, when yeah, you appeared, yeah. You've really gone right. over and above yeah. on this one to mm-hmm. try and confirm it for me. But, but to want to reaffirm this sense that you're going to find this child in, in a nobody position, in a nowhere place well, yeah. with nobody parents. Yeah. That even, I mean, at that point, it's almost as though, even though these angels told me this, the shepherd's going to go, this can't be the dude he's talking about, right? Oh. I mean, that sense that... Yeah, that well, maybe Jesus, you need that to think he, about those... He was so unexpected, even when this angel appeared and told you. Yeah. He's so unexpected mm. that even That's interesting. then... I never thought about it quite that way. You're going to yeah. need a sign to kind of confirm this, because yeah, yeah. You know, even if an angel says, this can't be the dude. Really? He's, right. in, he's in a manger. And these yeah. people are nobodies. This can't be the dude we're talking about. Right. A savior born Messiah? Well, and then some people, it, this would be more in keeping with how you read Matthew, and Matthew would always spell this out for you. They go, what sign? Is this sign as, or sign as fulfillment? So they, uh, Isaiah 1-3 is one of the few that they would mm. they would look to. Yeah, right. Um, the ox uh, and the donkey. They, they know their master and where their feet is, but Israel, does, my people, to say yeah. Israel, my people do my not people recognize. Not recognize. Yeah, I think I've got them yeah. down here somewhere. That's why all the mangers come with oxes and donkeys, by the way. Okay, the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's manger, but yeah. Israel does not know me. Right. Okay, yeah. That's why there's always an ox and a donkey. That's the only reason. Every yeah. manger yeah. that you buy. Right, yeah. Uh, they, yeah. And and, in, and some people have more animals of I, different I sorts do. in your manger. I do. Yeah, it's very biblical. It's very biblical. Yeah. Full Bible name yeah. and nativity I have. So they have this extraordinary experience, and then Mary, no doubt, said, um, Joseph, I think this child's going to be extraordinary. It's like, well, why is that, Mary? Because some farm workers came by and told me so. <laughs> and I'm also a Jewish mother, and I, we all think our son's going to be the Messiah. Yeah, you, so. you don't need to be a Jewish mother to believe your son's going to be the Messiah. So, <laughs> Absolutely. so and then the response is, uh, um, what we've seen, what you read, if you're reading through Luke, the response is joy and, and amazement, these things, uh, joy, and, and also sharing. One of the things is that the shepherds, uh, um, they go and they tell and They tell everybody. Yeah. 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 Would anybody listen to them? Uh, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, I mean, they don't, they're shepherds. They don't have the inherent persuasive uh, nature of a messenger like an angel does. Right. Or when he shows up with an army. So, yeah, it doesn't get into that, whether people believed it. But maybe the uh, maybe Isaiah foreshadows that maybe they don't. <laughs> okay. And Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. So Mary's been over against, you know, some elite person in 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 the story thus far, Zechariah, Mary's been exemplary. Mary's always responded correctly and, and joyously mm. and obediently. And she's always been the lens through whom we filter this story. Um, what, what is the treasured in her heart thing or pondered in her heart thing? It, it means that she is both obedient and to a degree um, um, receptive and recognizing and yet these are hard things to understand she's okay. she's she's processing processing and trying to figure out the implications of this and it's the kind of character you identify with it's like oh yeah you know this this would be tough even even <laughs> someone who who's just a role model is still trying to process this. this is so unexpected this is so it's what not does all this mean she made a baby book and and treasured these things yeah no, no, no. it's like you know the footprints of it and, and that's where we get the things and, you can get in gift shops in jerusalem exactly in bethlehem she treasured this little locket you know <laughs> lock of his hair and treasured these things no so this is she may have done okay it. scholars are not of one it's, opinion on that but that's not what lucas said you're less discerning scholars yes might say. right yeah, okay well i was curious yeah well, great. There's, yeah, I, if I, I hesitate to, to get back into this because I will just you will go just and keep talking about and this. Go and go. But it is kind of extraordinary the 
the this is a display maybe a displaced uh, family on a journey and it, it and if they're in their hometown surprisingly uh, family is absent here there's no yeah. there's not much about family no one so is taking them in it's debated about what does that mean that there's no room um, uh, it, it's crowded because of the census but uh, surprisingly over against the grandeur of uh, Augustus right okay. Here you have this displaced family who's relativized to this, you know, place where you normally no you know, place to lay their head. feed the right. animals. It's it's a real juxtaposition, uh, and yet the glory is spilling over mm-hmm. to people there, and uh, and then yeah. out in the field to the shepherds. Just thinking again in the Old Testament of the concern for the people who have no one. Right, you have Joseph and Mary, as you say, returning to a hometown and no one. It seems no family to take them in. I mean, it would be a responsibility of a family to do that. You know, you're supposed to show hospitality mm-hmm. to anyone, but certainly if you're related to these people, you need right. to take them in and provide for them. And that provide for might be presupposed that in within those within that uh, the it's culture really, of hospitality that some family has, and this is not this is not an outrageous. You would this would serve as a guest room. This is not oh, okay. that unusual. Okay. But that's not the way it's narrated, and that's no. not what's pointed to. And I'm not sure that Luke would have understood fully understood that mm-hmm. either mm. so the way it's narrated is that these are they are displaced uh refugees. Re, yeah, yeah they're refugees, refugees returning home and strangely absent is any mention of family nope. okay so whether they did or not it's narrated in a fashion that's like this is a strange uh uh epiph- epiphany you know <laughs> epiphany this is <laughs> a strange, strange manifestation, manifestation of, of and then strange here. incursions of god you know it is it's and it's like and so you have to ponder it's like this wow that wow what's this going to be what's mm-hmm. you know what they uh the the, the people at uh, at the, the parallel sort of birth and naming of of john in the earlier chapter everyone's wondering what everyone's wondering what this child will be and then and then the, uh, his tongue is loose uh, Ze- zechariah's tongue is loose and, and he can explain sing, yeah. yeah yeah so they asked the question so that they could answer it okay mm-hmm. Uh, and so they show you Mary pondering so you identify with her as you continue as a reader. It's like, oh, well, what does this mean? Okay. We're just at the beginning, you know? And then we build on Simeon and Anna, and then mm-hmm. we go to the temple appearance right. as a child. Yeah, yeah. And then we, right. we see him growing. Yeah. Uh, so examples and, of people who get it and people who don't get it, yeah. and people who are, are, are prepared and waiting and discerning, and then the people who, like, should know better and aren't discerning. Yeah. Uh, so when they're asking about naming the baby and it's not a family name and and the mother says his name is john it's like yeah whatever they turn to the father you know because that's the kind of culture it is and, right. they, and they have to motion to him because he's he's uh he can't hear deaf and speak. mute and, wow. and those would be signs of imperception in a time before sign language and whatnot right you know, so yeah so some people are very perceptive and they understand they're prepared for this visitation and others aren't and it's surprising who's prepared and who's the recipient of this this good mm-hmm. news well, I, I hope that that we have our hearts ready for manifestation this week mm. and uh, that we have prepared. I hope we are, coming back to Titus, living, uh, renouncing impiety and worldly passions and living lives of self-control, upright and godly lives. Holidays can be stressful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, can. Uh, and, you know, the, the other Christmas story that I do love to reference is the Revelation 13 one. And there are dragons ready to consume Mm. the joy of christmas in this world and hopefully we can uh, we can fight off those dragons and see god appear in these surprising places so uh, so may you have a good holiday may you have a good a true christmas and uh, may god surprise you in his manifestation this week amen so, blessings merry christmas merry christmas <laughs>